see those boats out on the water and be gearing up for fishing season. So thanks for joining us. Uh, we are we have the fortune of having Max Wolter join us again this year. He's always very kind to come out and give a State of the Chippewa Flowage presentation talking about the fishery and all the good work that he and his crew are out there doing. I'm excited this year about the Pike Improvement Project that's going on on the Chippewa Flowage. We've got a, a shared goal of harvesting 10,000 small pike out of the Chippewa Flowage to improve the fishery for all species. I know Max is going to be talking about that program and some of the exciting things that are going on, but uh, there's some great opportunities for prizes. And those of you who are in our opener tournament this weekend, Read the rules, because they're a little bit different than previous years. We've got extra prizes and extra cash for pike harvest. So take a, a look through the fine print there and harvest those pike. So with that, I will hand it over to Max. Thank you, Max. Oh, yeah, thanks for having me. This is It's always nice to be here. We get a nice turnout. That makes it really worthwhile for me to come. Um, kind of feel the excitement. It's like this is like Christmas Eve if you like fishing, right? So, a uh, big day tomorrow. Great weather. Couldn't ask for anything more. So, uh, what I'm going to do tonight, uh, very similar to past years, I'm going to kind of run through what we know from being on the water already this spring, doing our surveys. We'll talk a little bit about some of the management stuff going on and some kind of future directions. We'll talk a little bit about regulations and stuff. We'll talk about habitat, and then we'll talk about that pike improvement project that Amanda mentioned because that's kind of the big new exciting thing that's going on just for this year. So uh, as in the past, to keep this timely, I'm going to ask that we hold our questions until the end and then we'll just kind of open up the floor unless I'm just making no sense at all. If I've said something that is so confusing that you need me to clarify, then you can interrupt. But if you want to ask like where the best spot to go catch a bourbon is, let's do that at the end so we don't go down some weird <laughs> rabbit hole. Okay? All right. Whoops, double click there. So I got five, I think we're gonna do this. Let's do this, yeah. I got five main areas I'm gonna to touch on tonight. So we'll start with kind of what we know about 2019 from having been on the water already. We got out last week and did our, our walleye survey here. We talked a lot about panfish last year, so I wanna circle back to that and kind of close the loop. We'll talk about bass for a couple minutes. And then we'll get into walleye. We'll spend a lot of chunk, a chunk of time on that. And then this pike improvement project, which Amanda did a good job setting up for me and kind of teasing. How many of you have heard about that already? Okay, good. Most of you. So we'll talk a little more about why that's going on and what we hope to get out of it. So I mentioned that my crew has been on the water already. We put nets out here Tuesday of last week. And we, or no, Wednesday of last week, we ran them Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And we did a nice job. We hit kind of what I would consider to be the peak of the walleye spawn, which was that warm chunk of the second half of last week. Um, there's probably still a little bit of spawning going on, and certainly a lot of spawning behavior, especially from those males. Even though I would guess 80 or 90 percent of the females have dropped their eggs and have moved on, the males don't move on so easily. They hang on. They want to believe that that one more big girl's coming in, and they've still got something left in the tank. So you will probably still find males on traditional spawning areas, rock bars, rocky shorelines, um, anywhere there's some gravel. During the day, they're probably going to slide out a little deeper. The females are probably going to be going back into feeding mode. Uh, so it should be really good timing for a fishing opener happening this weekend. And we're going to be riding another nice little warm up. That should get all the different species of fish active walleye, panfish, pike, bass even potentially. Um, did get one big pre-spawn muskie in our walleye survey. That's always a fun little bonus. Uh, panfish, we didn't see a lot of them up shallow at the end of last week. And I would guess if you're out on the water in the last couple days, you probably didn't see them coming up yet. But it's going to happen. One of these days when the water temperature kind of hits their critical threshold, they're going to be pouring into those shallower dark bottom bays especially if you can find something protected from the wind that's going to be the first place you'll find panfish uh, until then they'll be kind of hanging out staging just a little bit deeper so that is what i know from being out on the water as far as what the different species are doing uh, pike they spawn even earlier than walleye so they're definitely done they are ready to eat uh, you can probably clobber them this weekend up shallow so uh, should be a lot of fun and we hope you'll do that we'll come back to that um, so I mentioned I want to talk panfish. We spent like an hour talking about panfish last year. We talked a lot about the regulations. Should they change? Should they stay the same? Really reasonable points to be made on both sides of that discussion. We ended up just kind of 
punting for now and just kind of holding on with the regulations that we've got. Um, that's the short answer. The long answer is we have goals and objectives for panfish on this flowage. I'm going to show you where we're kind of stacking up to those right now. Um, if we see an issue, that's when we would initiate that regulation change. Uh, but right now things are looking okay. We survey this water body every year so we keep a pretty tight finger on the pulse. When we're looking at crappies, this is crappie abundance. You can kind of see the west side is this green line and the east side is this red line. It bounces around a little bit, but this is our target range, this green band that might be somewhat difficult to see up, up at the front of this, the room here. Uh, but we're either in or above our target range for abundance in, a, in the last, well, decade really of surveys. We have a lot of crappies and that continued through last year. In fact, we saw one of the highest numbers of crappies in our nets last year. Bluegill is a slightly different story. Um, bluegill abundance had been really high around like 2010, 2012. We actually wanted it to come down because our target range is way down here. And we were successful in doing that. A couple things contributed to that. More walleye out there, more predators on bluegills. That's a good thing. And drawdowns probably knocked the bluegill numbers down a little bit. Now it seems really counterintuitive. Why would we want less of a fish? I'll show you in a second when we get to the size. So this is showing the size of both bluegill and crappie. The bluegill line is the percentage over 8 inches. The crappie line is the percentage over 10 inches. Look at bluegills to start with. When the abundance was really high, we had virtually no 8 inch bluegill. We are flatlining. We couldn't get them that big because there was too many of them. Once we started getting the abundance down, it starts creeping up, creeping up. And last year we saw about 15-16% of all our bluegill being over 8 inches. So that's really close to where we want to be. We want those big ones. And to do that, we have to have a lower abundance. Crappie, we're kind of bouncing around our target range. We went up kind of through it. We came back down last year. This year, we're back up again. That's kind of representative of how crappies, um, how their biology is. You get a big year class that comes through. You get a bunch of 10 inches for a while. We knock them back down. The next year class comes along. But in general, we're kind of in the neighborhood of where we want to be for crappies. If anything, we're maybe a little bit on the lower end of the, uh, the range. That might be related to their somewhat high density, but neither of those things shout, we need a big change in the regulations. But again, this is the kind of stuff we're gonna be looking at annually to know what's going on with panfish. So, just a quick thing on panfish, then we'll move to bass. Bass are kind of interesting right now because we have two different bass species out here, of course, largemouth and smallmouth, and they're doing different things right now. And that's probably a response to the habitat drawdowns that have been happening in the last five or six years. If we look at both the east side and the west side, uh, on the west side we're seeing a slight increase in smallmouth abundance, a slight decrease in largemouth abundance. On the east side we're seeing an even bigger decrease in largemouth abundance. Smallmouth abundance hasn't changed too much and there's actually a fairly high abundance of smallmouth on the east side. So what we see is that smallmouth, they don't mind those drawdowns and that kind of matches with their biology as a more riverine species. The water goes up, the water goes down in a river, they don't care, life goes on. Largemouth are much more of a stable lake environment species. They don't like those drawdowns as much, and so we've seen their abundance uh, decline. Really good smallmouth fishing still to be had on the east side. If we're looking at sizes between the two species, there's some similarities here. A lot of what I would call quality size fish, like 13 to 16 inches for both largemouth and smallmouth. Uh, especially true for smallmouth, there's a nice pile of fish that are kind of in that size range. You can see we do have a lot of small largemouth still. That's a harvest opportunity if you're catching a bunch of 10 inchers. Good to take a few of those home. That's why we kept that size limit off. We do see largemouth over 20 inches on occasion. We didn't last year, but we do see them. I have never seen a smallmouth over 20 inches in the thousands we've handled in the chip of flowage. And I don't know why. And I know Jim is, that's like your life mission, right? Is you want to get that. Yeah. So I think they're out there. I think the lake has the ability to produce them, but uh, they're certainly not as common as in Grindstone or Round or Lacouta Ray or some of those deeper, clear, rocky lakes. A little better suited for growing those super big smallmouth. But still, nice bass fisheries here um, and a, a largemouth population with the size has actually improved. Despite this little pile of small ones, we actually have a lot more 14, 15 inches than we had a number of years ago. So that's looking pretty good. All right, so we had to get the bass and the panfish done so we can talk about the things that you guys are probably most excited about for this weekend, walleye, right? Um, we're going to talk a lot about walleye. I'm going to show you a lot of data, hopefully not too much data, but I, I believe in sharing, right? So you guys are going to see everything I see when I look at this walleye population. 
But to start the conversation, I kind of want to put our minds into the context of where we were about 10 years ago. And that'll help us think about where we are today and where we might go. Almost 10 years ago, just before I started, we were kind of in crisis mode out here. For the first time in the history of this incredible lake, the walleye were not reproducing. And this happened for consecutive years where there was no natural year class. That was happening on a bunch of other lakes too. Nelson Lake was in full on panic mode at that point in time. Sisabagama was struggling, Big Chautauk. The list goes on and on. Out here, we had a very ambitious private stocking effort that came into the picture around this time, the Big Chip Fish Fest. Raised tens of thousands of dollars, stocked tens of thousands of extended growth walleye to plug that gap. But the hope was always that natural reproduction would come back because that's what drives a truly successful walleye fishery. Um, and it did. That's a pretty incredible story because it has not come back on Nelson Lake or Big Chautauk or Sisabagma, but it's come back here. And we've done a lot of things to try and make that happen. The habitat drawdowns, a lot of that, the parameters of that are kind of designed to be as good for walleye as they can be and make these conditions favorable for them. Another thing we did is in 2015, we put the regulations on that we have today, which include the 15 inch minimum length limit, the 20 to 24 protected slot for those females, uh, and we've been riding them out since this time. So one of the things we're gonna look at today is what are those regulations doing for us? Is it a good fit for where we're at today or not? I know a lot of people are catching a lot of fish under 15 inches. As you can see from the size, there's a lot of them out there. The good news in this slide is hidden in this little number right here, which is the number we catch per net in our surveys. And this goes back to 2014, and then this is last year, 2018, on the east side, including some nets that you can see right out the window here um, from Deerfoot. 2014, we caught 10 per net night. 2018, we caught 21. So in the last five years or so, we've been able to approximately double this walleye population. We'll be getting a more firm grasp on these numbers in a couple of years when we do a lake-wide population estimate, when we come up with the number of how many walleye are out there. Um, that's a huge effort, we can't do it every year. So in the meantime, we kind of rely on, on what we would call a relative abundance or the number we catch per net. Now when we look at size, we actually see a lot of similarities between 2014 and 2018. A lot of 13 to 15 inch fish, a few over 15 inches. This green band, actually I can zoom in on that for you. This green band is kind of our legal fish that we had in 2018. And you can see something that might look kind of familiar if you're a walleye angler, a lot of them under 15. I'm guessing a lot of you folks are catching those. We only had 5% over 20 inches on the east side. That's not super uncommon for us. We tend to get more big females on the west side and more bigger walleye in general. So I'll show you that in a moment. But when you take this number and subtract it from that number, which is the percentage over 15 inches, we get the percentage between 15 to 20, which is our harvest slot, 22%. So in our surveys, we're seeing one out of every five on the east side. And that was last year. Oh, there, I just showed you where the length limit is if you weren't aware. Here's the west side, 2019. This data is as fresh as it gets. I just worked this up on Monday, I think, after we finished our survey. Slightly better size structure over there probably related to slightly faster growth, which is something we've consistently seen between the east side and the west side. 34% over 15 inches, 8% over 20 inches, which means we have about 26% in that harvest slot or one out of every four. Now I'm guessing most of you who fished last year were not catching one out of every five being a keeper or one out of every four being a keeper. Your numbers are probably a little different. You're probably catching a lot of these fish. That's at least a lot of the reports I've heard. So what I wanna do is zoom in on these fish. Who are they? Are these slow growing fish that are stunted and are never gonna make it to 15 inches? I hear that all the time. Are they young fish that just haven't had a chance to get there? Are they males? Are they females? Let's look at who they are and that's gonna give us a feel for what this 15 inch length limit's doing for us right now. So the first question we wanna ask is, are they growing slowly? After you've caught maybe your 10th consecutive 14 and a half inch walleye, you start wondering, what's going on? Are they actually getting to 15 inches? Um, what we did is we pulled a spine off of the backs of walleye of all different sizes in both sexes last year. We worked those up, they have rings on them, so we can figure out the age of those fish. And then we can plot that. So we've got the age along the bottom and their length here, and we can get this growth trajectory. We can figure out how fast they're getting to a critical length, and I highlighted 15 inches here as our critical length. Females are making it to 15 inches in four years. Males are making it to 15 inches in five years. Very typical to see different growth between the two species, two sexes. 
I have never seen an instance where males are growing faster than females. The girls always seem to have a little better figured out. Uh, also, that's part of their hardwiring. That's their biology is to <coughs> add more body size so that they can carry more eggs, right? Males, they just kind of are happy to hang out and produce other stuff that's not eggs. Um, this is what I would describe as extremely average growth. It's not slow, but it's also not fast. The average for walleye in, north, in, in northern Wisconsin for both sexes combined is four and a half years. So we're right there. Um, we'll talk later on about that growth and whether there are things we can do to improve it. Certainly that would get more fish into that legal size range faster. But before we get to um, that, I kind of want to show you the same data, but instead of just averages, I'm going to show you all the fish that we aged. And I flipped it. So now age is over here and length is along the bottom so we can look at individual year classes. Each line here is a year class, and each dot is fish. So um, we can start down here with our two-year-olds. They're around 10 inches. We get a couple males that are very precocious, and they mature a little earlier than everybody else, and, and they're out there ready to go at two years old. They think it's great. Um, by three years old, we see almost all of our males are becoming mature. They're averaging around 12, 13 inches. Four years old, now we start to see some of the females showing up, they're mature. That's gonna be most of the fish that are over 15 inches at four years old. And again, most of the males haven't quite made it there at that point in time. By five years old, now we actually see a majority of our five-year-olds being legal. Some interesting things going on here though. Look at the spread within an individual year class. These four-year-olds are a great example. A four-year-old walleye could be anywhere from 10 to 18 inches. We like to assume that they're kind of cookie cutters and they all grow at the same rate and the year class kind of marches through. But these are individuals with as much variation as any other species. Some dogs get bigger than their brothers and sisters. Some people get bigger. Um, there's all sorts of factors that come into play with fish. The other thing that's interesting is if you look at a certain length, let's say 14 inches, if you catch 10 14 inch fish tomorrow, you might assume we got a big year class coming through. Look at all these 14s. Well, based on our analysis, that could be anywhere from a three-year-old to a seven-year-old. So there could be a huge range just within an individual size if you look at it that way. So um, the other thing that this graph tells me as a biologist is if stunting was a problem, if stunting was the big limiting factor for our walleye population out here, we would have a ton of fish showing up in the area that, uh, that encircles this box. That would mean fish are getting older and older and older and they're not getting to 15 inches. They've figured out the game. They, they pass on that perch because it's gonna make them just a little bigger and they decide, nope, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast today, I'm gonna be good, I'm gonna do my Weight Watchers, and I'm gonna stay at 14.9. That's not what we're seeing out here. Um, we see just a few fish in here, but for the most part, by the time they're five or six years old, we're seeing the whole year class has made it to legal size. So this may create more questions than it answers, potentially. So we're gonna have to look at the other side of the coin here. If the fish are getting to legal size, if they're not growing slowly, where are they going? How can we don't have more and more and more legal fish every year? Uh, well, we do a, on a, to a small, on a small scale, but it's not like a, an earth-changing amount of new legal fish. So what we're going to look at here is a concept called mortality. And it is exactly what it sounds like. We talked about it with panfish last year. It is the rate at which they die, right? These fish are not immortal. They die for all sorts of reasons. Some of them are reasons that, that have to do with us. We would call those, those reasons fishing mortality. So it's the fish that are going home in your live well, it's the fish that are going home when tribal members are out harvesting, and there's also a component of fish getting hooked and come into someone's boat and they try to release them and it dies anyway. Deep hooked fish, something like that. Fish caught when it's way too warm, fish brought up from, from way too deep, which isn't a huge issue out here. So there's that fishing mortality component, but you know what? If there was a zombie virus and it wiped out all the fishermen on the planet, walleye would still die out here. There's all sorts of natural ways that walleye die, including old age and starvation, winter kill, um, predation obviously, parasites, other forms of stress, heat stress. Those two things combined come up with what we call total mortality. And the way we figure that out is we look at how many four-year-old fish did we catch, and then how many five-year-old fish, and then how many six-year-old fish, and you can actually see your classes leaving the population by plotting that line. This might be a little morbid, but I'm gonna go there anyway. If you want to think about this in our own lives as humans, lots of us are going to make it to 70 years old. Very few of us are going to make it to 100 years old because mortality kicks in for humans at that rate at age two. And you can see how people phase out of the population just like fish phase out of the population. And in the Chippewa Flowage, our mortality estimate for walleye is 
half of our adult walleye die every year. It's a terrifying number, right? We have, we have to start something like, save the walleye campaign, we need bumper stickers. But when it comes to a species like walleye, and also with panfish, high mortality is part of the game. That's what we're managing for. I could bring this number down, if I put a 28 inch length limit out there, who would like that? Who would be happy with that? Nobody. Because we manage for mortality on walleye. It's a harvest oriented species. The challenge is we don't know exactly what percentage are going home with anglers, what percentage are dying of natural causes without doing a whole bunch more work. We are gonna do that in a couple years. We're gonna have an opportunity. But in the meantime, we're working off this rough kind of number. Some people are more visual learners. So we're gonna, we're gonna show you this visually with a year class. So let's say we had 53 year old walleye. And if we wanted to scale this up for the flowage, we could say it's 50,000. Each of these represents 1,000 walleye. I wasn't going to put 1,000 icons out there. 50. Between their third and fourth birthday, 25 of them are going to die. Half of them. Some of them are going to go home with you folks. Some of them are going to go home with tribal members. Some of them are going to hit their head on a dock and roll over and die. But we're going to lose half of them, based on our estimate. Between year four and year five, we lose another half. So in two years, we've lost 75% of what was a pretty strong year class. And once you have that understanding, it really helps you read these size histograms that we put together. Because as size is increasing, age is increasing. And so you see a lot of fish here, and then they start to drop out. That's our mortality. And that's why uh, in, in a healthy population, 14 inch fish are almost always more common than 16 inch fish. And 16 inch fish are more common than 20 inch fish because they're dying at that rate. So that stair step you see is that mortality. Now, how, does it, how do we actually get more legal sized fish out there? Right? Well, a variety of means. One way is to just have more fish, right? Just have more walleye. And when you look at our recruitment history, which is the number of new walleye coming into the lake, we are still kind of recovering from this gap. This was that kind of critical point I talked about when the private stocking came in. We had that lull in recruitment. In the last five years, we've had three nice year classes. They're not world records or anything like that. They don't even really stack up that well to the past, but they're solid. We're putting new fish into this lake at a rate that we hadn't been doing. If we can continue that trajectory and continue having nicer and bigger year classes, that's going to help our ability to produce more illegal sized fish because we may catch up with that mortality. At some point, we may start producing more fish than we are taking out and building up more legal sized fish. There's other tricks too. I mentioned we could put a high size limit on it and limit the mortality in that regard. That would undoubtedly create more 16, 17, 18 inch fish. We're not gonna do that. That's kind of a trick. It doesn't actually create more legal size walleye, it just creates more big walleye. But again, we manage for harvest out here for this species. One idea that's very popular and I hear all the time is to move the goalpost in the other direction. Lower the size limit to 14 inches. I've heard 14 and a half inches. I've heard 14 and 7 eighths inches as a serious proposal. Um, <laughs> based on everything we know about growth, mortality, from tracking this population, what we would have is we would have, you know, kind of like a Black Friday sale. <laughs> there would be a lot of legal walleye for a short amount of time, and then the shelves would be empty, and we would have a new bottleneck happening at 14 and a half or 14 and 7 eighths inches. So we want to continue to kind of manage this consistently and, and try and build on the success we've had without going to kind of those short-term measures. That said, none of the regulations on this lake or any lake in my management area are off limits for discussion and reevaluation. And I hope you can see that we're putting in the work to continue to look at these things and figure out what's going on here. Is this a good fit for us or not? And if we find something's not, we'll change it. And a good example of that would be if we did have that monster year class. If we had a hundred per mile little walleye this fall, when those fish are growing up, their growth probably is going to be a lot slower. And then we might need to change the limit because they may not get to 15 inches at a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so we'll be looking at that basically every year. Now, the last trick, and the one I really like, because it's something we can start tomorrow, is to try and increase their growth. Now, I'm not talking about some sort of ambitious million dollar perch stocking plan. It sounds kind of fun, but it also sounds very expensive. There's a cheaper way that we can create more food for walleye. And that's still the fundamental thing that all our fish need to grow. They need food. You know, we can talk about genetics and get cute and fancy, but really, it's do they have something in their belly? Do they have energy coming in that they can turn into more body mass? To do that, they need more prey. Now, again, we're not going to stock perch, so what can we do? We can look at what else is eating the same thing that walleye do. 
And if we can reduce the abundance of those species, we have a real chance of creating more food for walleye and improving their growth. And that, friends, is the tie-in to the Pike Improvement Project.